Namaste everybody. This is Satya Narayana, my indirect inventor industries, private limited Hyderabad. Today's our topic is indigenization and setting up a precast plant in India. So about inventor industries. I have established this inventor industries in 1979 for producing the fine chemicals. Now we have a USFD approved facility for producing API. We diversified into agro products in 2007 for producing white button mushrooms at two locations. And we further diversified into building product division established in 2016, where it's uh, comprising precast products, AIC, and power block manufacturing facilities. So now we have four precast plants with the largest installed capacity and now we have installed capacity of production for 6 million square feet per year of various types of building and our AIC and the Powers block plants are also largest facilities in the country. The four locations we have the major gas plant near Amravati that near Vijayawada and another uh, plant in Hyderabad one in Rajamandri and another one in Bhavan as well. These are few of the projects which we have taken up. This is a two bedroom apartment block for the GHMC. About 972 flats uh, we have built. This is the commercial building near Vijayawada. This is the uh, laboratory in Hyderabad. And this is the economic weaker section for the Bonus Development Authority, where we made a changes in the precast construction type to so the uh, cash in situ construction type to precast type, providing 15% additional area without any enhancement in the pricing. This is our industrial buildings, both in Kamravati and in Hyderabad. So now indigenization is setting up of the of course, our experience. So we have concentrated on looking at analyzing this type of equipment, and uh, which is needed to be imported, which certainly has to be imported, which need to be, which can be produced in India. So we outsource the most important required equipment for producing the hollow slabs from Elimatic in Finland, then the shuttles for concrete transportation. And you can see the concrete distribution hopper and the top of red cranes and these things we have uh, integrated together through automation where the concrete is distributed into the extruder uh, automatically. So we have also produ produced the required uh, hollow core beds with its required abutment plates. Uh, for all our plants. Then we also made tables, stationary, tilting, and different kinds of molds, what is needed. And we customized it to requirements, what is needed for the production of specific elements. We also set up a, indigenously set up a circulation line which otherwise would have costed a lot of money and we could develop that with component sourcing and integrating different components to make fully ingenious able circulation line in the country. So we have also made the abutments for the columbium beds of 1.2 by 1.2 and also for the hollow core beds. These are the AIC plants and this is the power plant. Again, the main machine is imported from Germany and all total power handling system is indigenized and automated and uh, functions like a robotic facility. So we have in-house fabrication shop where we producing all those tables and uh, some components. We are outsourcing, we are integrating here in the facility. So why indigenization is? We are importing the 
equipment for pickets, it will be very highly priced because of the hard dimensions of the machines and then of course obviously the long lead times for the importing, sailing and those things. And the minimum order quantities required for placement, international procurement. And also the customization needs, if any customization needed, the, the importer has to make fit into the producer's uh, sizes because they will try to sell what they have got as a standard item to be done. So we should adopt the slogan given by our Prime Minister that we should and have the cap capabilities of indigenizing the uh, equipment production by enhancing our engineering capabilities. So what is the status of indigenization? In our four plants put together, except for extruders and three shuttles, rest all other equipment we have indigenously either fabricated or assembled or sourced and taking into control full automation and coding everything in-house with our past experience of other disciplines of activity what we are having. And in this thing, we have produced our tables and casting beds, abutment, staircase and all special mold. Whatever is needed, have you been producing? And these are available. Even elsewhere, there could be other manufacturers to be making it. And these jacks and concrete handling system, batching plant, and all those things are available now in India. That indigenization has happened already. So, for the components for the precast industry, also, we have the loops and uh, grotic couplers and uh, splice joints, uh, various types of these things, and the lifting hooks and the inserts. These things are all now indigenously available, except for any very special component where for the customer requirement you may have to import, otherwise, they are mostly available in India. Like I said, the except the extruders for alocore production and the concrete shuttles. Everything else is available. And practically speaking, without the alocore slab, all other precast elements required for the precast industry in India can be now readily produced in India. They have, we have got the capability of producing those things. What are all the challenges? Challenges, high initial R&D costs, low business volumes, lack of options, supply chain, and approach to innovation in academics and curriculum. So, by having a proper interaction and coordination between industry and academia, the first step is to make the precast uh, construction more and widely familiar to different agencies. This should start from the student level and academia should start looking into the development of the connection techniques and those kind of innovations. We should look into it. Then for adapting the, the drive or the driving agent for the precast mission indigenization is adapting of the precast technology in the government technology and making the coding or the IS codes modification to suit or to be in line with the international codes of ACI, PCI in the connection methodologies and the other proven connection methodologies which are already being implemented elsewhere. By adapting these technologies and making it easy to adapt to precast technologies, then the drive will come. More and more people can go into the precast construction. When you go for more people, then obviously the demand for the equipment will trigger. The obviously, you should make the conducive environment for, for the precast by adapting the standards elsewhere available in the industry. And then 
the government policy to standardize the encourage the precarious construction in a standard format for the weaker section housing and other places by type design thing. Uh, the adapting precarious technology for type design equipment, equipment construction uh, facilities, uh, dwelling units would be most efficient. Probably it may result in uh, lower rate of, uh, cost of uh, construction also. So, for an, the indigenization encouragement only comes through the requirement. More requirement obviously will drive the more indigenization of the things. And the politicization given by the government by the precarious construction will obviously drive the everything else. We can take the, an example of the Singapore, now where they have, as a government policy, they have said 80% of construction is done in precast, and then they have set up a government R&D facility where the construction methodology and the policies and the uh, coding is developed in their government facility, that's the BCA. Then what is that industry wants it? Okay, the government can give, consider giving the tax benefits in proportion with the indigenous to imported equipment for the precast facilities, uh, uh, industries, profits. That will be an incentive for the indigenization of the precast machinery. Thank you very much. The world is urbanizing faster than ever. Consumer and institutions have become more demanding. In this complex landscape, rules of building a masterpiece have changed. Star Wars has been always ahead of curve because of our deep expertise in construction and latest building material and timely adoption of new technology. evolving. We have created a business model that empowers our customers to have high quality products with optimum cost and time. We call this model as Imagine, Innovate and Integrate. Imagine is how we apply design thinking to the blueprint before construction to achieve comfort and sustainability. Once the architectural design is given to us, we can complete the design of any project end to end, including MEP. We also do the design for precast, prepare the precast shop floor drawings, get it validated by any third party like IIT and also do the formwork design. As a design team, we have almost 30 professionals, which gives us an overall experience of more than 100 years. Innovate is how we apply our deep expertise to solve real construction problems in most novel and advanced way. Our expertise and ability to innovate allows to tailor the work methodology to suit the client's architectural imagination. 
we have stretched our technical expertise to deliver the sophisticated outcomes. Our quality engineer get it right first time and enhance quality at all the stages. We do this by implementing proper uh, methodology and work inspection. This is the Arzheimer B60 and the where the area is insufficient and precise. This equipment can be used very easy, uh, easily comfortable and this is very uh, precise equipment. This is digimetric uh, micrometer and this is uh, we are using for the checking the, all the incoming material to find out the accurate thickness. With this type of tools implemented, we achieve a high quality, less tolerance and zero rectification. We wish to achieve all our construction without plastering and grinding by optimal usage of quality formwork system and concrete technology. While doing so, we also benchmark ourselves with the best practices in health, safety and environment across the globe. The last part of our business model is integrate, which means we do everything end to end. Everything we do under one umbrella so that our customers can be rest assured from end-to-end -end solution to their construction needs. Pura West End is an example. From excavation to seal works to handing out to customers, including MEP, we have done it all end-to-end. -end. We have done we have 735 units with 6.9 million safe bandages. Today, the construction industry is scaling newer heights with advanced technologies and state-of-the-art scientific innovations. World leaders in the construction industry have time and again realized that time is money and constructions are not done brick by brick, but floor by floor. Shobha Indraprastha is one of our landmark project which we are doing in the west of Bangalore, very close to the city railway station. Now this project is basically designed on shear while concept and we wanted to contemplate usage of the most advanced form of concrete in line with the shear wall. After a lot of brainstorming, we decided to use smart dynamic concrete over here 
in place of conventional concrete. Technology not only supports the customers to design a robust solution but also meets the sustainable requirements of environment by reducing carbon footprints. It offers durability to the structure which ensures minimal maintenance during the service life. Probably for the first time in the history of Indian construction industry, a tall residential structure has been built, 36 floors to be precise, where there is absolutely no plastering. And in terms of sustainability, because in this project, again, hats off to the effort done by BSF and the Shoba team, we were able to replace close to 10,000 tons of cement by GGBS or slag. This also adds to the techno-commercial benefit by reducing the activity of plastering. The cycle time of reduction of the slab cycle ensures timely delivery of projects. If you add all that and take the carbon footprint, I think we saved close to anywhere around 10 to 12,000 tons of carbon which otherwise would have gone into the environment. We are at one of our largest project, Provident Park Square on Kanakpura Road, Bangalore, where Starworth is doing the design and build of a 2.6 million square feet project. This project has got 19 towers, one basement, ground floor, and 13 and 14 floors, depending on the configuration. What we will do, we will go through the project model and a, a brilliant experience center which Starworth design team has created. We'll have a look at the mock-up and then we will go to the actual project site where we will get a feel of how this project is being done with the use of a state-of-the-art precast factory and how these precast elements are being produced and erected. One of the requirement of our client provident was that they wanted to give a feel to their customer that the product if it is dissected into different parts how the technical specification could be fed and seen by the client our design team worked very extensive on it and created a beautiful experience center wherein we have shown that by using precast and the conventional system how the difference is bought in various aspects of the elements for example be it a wall, be it a false ceiling, be the flooring, be the windows how precast technology because it is all set and defined can ensure that the right quality and the right dimensions will be achieved in the project. One of the most important thing in SICL or Starworth is our focus on health, safety and environment. This is something which we don't compromise. So as a rule, it's mandatory for everyone right from top to bottom that once they enter the site, they have to have the personal protective equipment that is the shoes, the helmets and the jackets. We are at Starworth Precast Production Unit which has been set up to do Provident Park Square. This factory is set up in a closed area of 80,000 square feet. And just to give you a brief, 
Provident Park Square Phase 1 has got 1.2 million square feet to be done in two years' time. Each floor area has 7,000 square feet or in other words, roughly close to 300 elements to be done. Now we are working on a cycle time of 8 to 10 days per floor. So as to achieve this, we have got the equipments from Bullard, which is the leading precast manufacturer since last 90 years from Germany. So we have a setup from Bullard to do these elements. We have also got the shuttering elements from Singapore to cast each individual elements and with this kind of a setup the quality of the elements which will be produced will have a tolerance of plus minus 5 mm and a durability which will be much much higher than the conventional system this factory is one of the best factories in the country today with all the modifications and the automations which has been done one of the most important thing in precast construction unlike the conventional construction is that in case of conventional construction once the gfc is done the drawings are all set but in case of precast the gfc's have to be that is the good for construction drawings have to be converted into what is called as a shop floor drawing so this is a typical shop floor drawing now this particular shop floor drawing will give you all the details which goes into the element like as you can see the you know when we do the precast element we will have the shutters now these shutters are fixed based on these drawing and the type of element which has to be made these shutters are supported with the magnets so that these shutters doesn't move once these shutters are fixed then the reinforcement which is prepared is bought and kept inside as per the drawing now all those fitments the electrical conduits all the cutouts everything is fitted into the elements once all this is ready the QC department checks for all the quality inspection as per the drawing and then the concrete is poured and the element is taken out once it achieves a strength of 10 to 12 newtons roughly in around 10 to 12 hours and it is ready for dispatch then these elements are sent to the site and erected
hello namaskar good morning good afternoon this is a case study of 11 story yeah a uh, case study of 11 story residential apartment building constructed using precast construction technology at uh, dundigal hyderabad right for greater hyderabad municipal corporation uh yeah i am i am ca prasad and the director of nitya engineering consultancy private limited based at hyderabad so in this uh, particular presentation we are trying to demonstrate and show you how precast can be used for multi story residential construction also okay all developers can uh, uh, switch over to precast construction and move away from the conventional construction which is tedious and uh, very much labor intensive okay and i have i have seen that uh, shobha developers and brigade developers have also taken up this precast into their constructions and they are already using the precast uh, construction as they face a severe problem in the labor uh, availability for their constructions so develop it is time for the developers to uh, have the uh, precast by themselves or they can they, they can give work to the precast industry Yeah, which are being uh, set up by the some entrepreneurs, especially in Hyderabad, we have about a four precast companies around, and developers can use this and then use their multi-story constructions, right? So this is uh, uh, the um, to demonstrate this particular one for the GHMC 2 BHK housing, which is still plus parking plus nine floors at Dundigal. We have uh, more, you have constructed some of the towers. using the precast construction if you just see the site layout okay this is the main contractor is uh, ijm okay uh, indrajit mehta constructions ijm constructions they are basically from delhi but they are uh, they have moved on to hyderabad to do this uh, 2 bhk housing for the uh, government of telangana okay and then they have done this big project which consists of about uh, above 40 towers uh, in this particular site layout So, so Satyavani is the main consultants for this for uh, both conventional construction and mywan whereas uh, we are the precast uh, consultant precast structural consultants uh, for this particular project and here the project is conceived in such a way by satyavani consultants uh, by my friend uh, mr uh, sur prakash that uh, they they want to demonstrate that all three technologies can be used here conventional as well as mywan construction which is actually called as a monolithic construction where wall and slab concreting is done together conventional as all of you know it is a rc frame construction rc columns and beams and uh, infill walls will be coming in between okay and then we wanted to do precast also but all of them at the same cost so to demonstrate that okay if you can have some uh, number of repetitions given for uh, for each technology okay the cost of construction would be easier so thereby we said here the governments can call for tenders okay irrespective of the technology not to, not to be very specific into that such that the contractor or developer can come forward with the uh, type of uh, technology that he wants to use that is very wonderfully demonstrated here all the new technologies are used here this building is such that if you just see one block it has a stilt floor for motorcycle car parking these apartments are also such that i will just show here that each of this is about 570 square feet apartments including the corridor and common areas including the corridor and the common areas yeah, if we just take it out it will be around 480 500 or so internally each apartment excluding the, the corridor and sun stays so in this uh, they are provided is a very small unit by a uh, 570 sft as was i am talking about um they have provided only motor cycles for the people they are basically called lig buildings not mig buildings okay two bed or two bhk and then uh, motor cycle car parking is given in the street floor as well as in the parking floor and then they have certain ramps on either side of the building and they also have the uh, yeah it is uh, called as ew housing basically not even lig my friend corrects me because the building already built uh, i i lost a bit of touch into that okay ews building basically they point it 
but uh, for according to PMAA, EWC buildings are all you know, 300 and 350 below, and above that it is called LIG. But here the government called it as EWS housing, okay. And then but it is 570 SFT, but they have given 2 BHK, right? And then there are shops given in the steel floor, uh, shops given in the steel floor, and then there is a motorcycle car, car parking, okay. In the even in the parking floor also. Uh, it is uh, they uh, they have provided the motorcycle parking and then there are some electrical rooms and ramps will only go, come up to this point. Thereafter, above this is all the all the way the apartments, all the way the apartments. So you can see that each of these are such that two apartments, lift, two apartments, lift, two apartments are coming like that. Two apartments, staircase, two apartments, staircase, two apartments, staircase. So this is how the plan. If I just show you the individual two uh, apartment plan, you can see the dimensions clearly. Bedroom three meter by two point six three, bedroom two point eight six by three meter. One attached toilet, one general toilet, living room, dining here. Okay, there's a living room and a small dining room also can be placed here. And then there is a kitchen and then there is a utility for a wash and uh, other things. Okay, there's, there is a similar uh, uh, unit on the other side. Okay, whereby the here. The similar pattern when the bedrooms are coming there, but one bedroom is will be coming on the corridor. There is a slight disadvantage, but uh, that is how the plan is done by the architects. For this plan, we have done the precasting in such a way that we have provided all external walls are precast RCC walls of about 160 mm thick. This building uh, of about uh, 11 story building, 160 mm thick walls are uh, provided, precast RCC walls. And they have two layers of reinforcement in, in that. Okay, and hollow core slab will come and say, and rest on this particular wall. Okay, so you can see that yeah, all these walls are and are provided like that, and the precast RCC walls are such they are pretty smooth and they don't require plastering at all. Okay, or well, now what about the internal walls? You are looking at all these internal walls. Here the contractor want to build it by himself by, by using uh, the brick masonry walls. Sorry, uh, AAC blocks such that no plastering is required, but they put uh, um, the putty and then they painted it. AAC block walls and then putty and then painted on top of the AAC block walls are pre pre pretty much lighter. Its density is between 600 to 800 kg per cubic meter. All of them are 100 mm thick. And these hollow core slabs are designed in such a way that uh, these partition wall loads are also coming on top of them and they are designed according to that. So it has a live load it, uh, of 2 km per square meter, floor finishes are 1.5 km per square meter. Again, partition walls are about 1.5 km per square meter. That is the loading to which the hollow core slab is designed for a span of about nearly 7 meters, okay, on the side, uh, 6 to 7 meters. So these are predominantly a one-way slab, one-way slab, hollow core slab, predominantly one-way slab. They will have the hollows inside. Okay, such that the uh, weight is reduced into that. Pre-stressed pre cast slab, pre-stressed wires are used into this. Okay, so the slabs are resting on this wall and this wall only, two walls. They are not resting on that, but they will be just going onto the side of the wall to an extent of 40 mm. And then on top of this, structural topping is done. Okay, and such that you will get a monolithic action for the entire thing. I'll show you some of the photographs where they have done the structural topping and monolithic action achieved. The precast states are also used. It is quite uh, easy to do the, uh, the, the steps in precasting and then lift it and place it over that. Unlike the conventional system of providing a formwork and then pouring concrete, which is very tedious, and the contractors, uh, former contractors, will try to avoid doing that work and then sleep and then someone else have to do it. So you can see here. The precast walls are erected, and then the hollow core slab is getting rested on top of them. You can see that from wall to wall there will be dovels going into that, and the next wall will be going will have sleeves, and it will be rested onto that. We are given a recess here such that the hollow core slab will come and rest here. Okay, it will come and rest by about 60 to 80 mm is a bit. You can see some of these blocks. Yeah, you can see some shops here, and then in the openings, and then the walls with the openings, window openings. And then ventilator openings on the outside they are being provided. Okay, so this is how the details and some uh, this, this, this is a toilet portion. We are also given the openings for the drainage pipes to come out. Okay, that's how the the is provided. 
and the plots is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 floors is down. Uh, the uh, ninth floor is the uh, one which is on top of that. Okay, there are some of the photographs that uh, are showing this precast walls. You can see that pretty smooth surface which uh, which comes when it is cached on the uh, uh, table. So this is how they will provide uh, the uh, precast wall on the table. Okay, but duly providing the openings and these are the sleeves for the double to come and rest and then it will be grouted. Okay, it will be grouted. So you can see that there are the magnetic canisters, okay, to such that you know the, this is a steel table, and then they provide the magnetic canisters such that the formwork will not move. That's the beauty. Even here you can see that there are the magnetic canisters. Okay, this will be sticking to this table as well as to that, such that the formwork will not move. You can see the diagonal reinforcement at the openings. Okay, is a typical of our standard details which will be being provided. Even inside also they have provided a magnetic canister. Such that this is something like a steel channel, which is being placed there, such that it won't move while they are placing the concrete. This uh, wall panel does not have the openings, so it has this uh, two-layer reinforcement and the sleeves which are coming in and the bevels protruding out into that. So this is how the thing is. You can see that uh, this is a strip foundation that we have provided. Why is a strip foundation? Wherever the wall comes, I, I want the foundation there only, such that it takes the pressure of the the load that is coming through the wall and then transmits it to the soil. So there are all the dovels which will go into the sleeves of the wall and then it will be grouted onto that. It's such that it achieves a rigidity and the monolithicity. Between the two walls, you, this wall will have a link, this wall will have a link. We have provided a P16 U bar and then we have provided the additional links also such that it gets a monolithicity and continuity of reinforcement between the two walls. Okay. And then in this uh, site, we have also tested uh, the hollow core slabs. Yeah, you can see that the hollow core slab is being erected and a person is going to support the, with the cement bags. The equivalent load is being placed on top of that. Okay, and then the dive gauges are put on the top. Precast hollow core slab is such that when it is pre-tested and precast, it will have a slight camber on the top to about some 20 to 25 mm, depending on the length. Okay, depending on the length. If the length is more, then the camber is also more in the center, while at the edges it will be resting on the walls or beams. So the delegates are placed when the load is placed, and as per the code, it should be taking a, the deflection down to a certain extent, and that is being checked and passed here. You can see that here, the NIT Varangal Professor CBK, CB Kamesh Rao is there, and myself here at this testing and his team of experts have also come okay, along with him to make this testing to provide the dial gauges, take the readings. And then the table is not uh, ready and the people are making the, uh, the particular reinforcement cages here, due fully tight here, okay? And then this is being lifted with the help of a uh, hydra to be put up onto the table, such that the walls are cached like this and stored in this vertical manner and it will have the uh, lifting hooks such that it will lift it and then place it on the uh, one over the other on the in the structure. Okay, these doubles will be coming. Hollow course slab will be resting here, so you can see this particular uh, type of construction. Right, this is how the hollow course slab will have the clamps. Sorry, hollow course slab will have the clamps, and then it will be slowly resting it on the uh, recess that we have given here. Okay, so these are some of the ongoing construction photographs, okay? Uh, while it is under construction, you can see this, block 29, block 26, we had some places where completion is done. They're trying to fix the in waste pipes also, okay? So after it is everything is completed, they have finished even the drainage pipes also for this 11 story building and all, okay? So this uh, uh, printing is going on. This is a completed shape of the building. So I give you a brief idea of uh, how these precast walls are coming up, hollow core slab is coming on onto the top, okay, um, as a floor slab element, and then the drainage pipes on the outside, which will be coming into that, okay. So these are my details. For any information, you can uh, come back to us for any details, and then there is a phone number also into that. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, a very good day to everybody.
Thank you for inviting me for this presentation. Our topic is uh, do it right the second time. You will have to do it a second time very painfully if you do not do it right the first time. That is me, T.P. Singh. We provide custom solutions to all kinds of problems related to concrete. I've had the good fortune of a very varied experience in structural engineering, geotechnical engineering, concrete technology, and material research. So this presentation uh, seeks to sensitize the industry regarding the importance of following correct practices, doing it right the first time so that precast technology in buildings, which is relatively new, can live up to its reputation of efficiency, economy, safety, and sustainability. We're going to uh, present the case history of a hollow core slab failure. Uh, in precast buildings, as you know, often we have these pre-stressed hollow core slabs which are uh, erected like this and then they are covered with a concrete topping about two to three inches thick. Uh, in the building under question, uh, these slabs were erected and the topping was installed. About six days after the topping was placed, uh, one of the slabs developed this prominent mid-span crack. So immediately this slab was propped. Uh, within a couple of days, this whole thing was dismantled and the slab brought down. So the problem was threefold. Number one, to diagnose the cause for the sudden failure. Second, to examine the soundness of the structure already built. Seven stories had been built. And third, to decide the fate of 300 slabs already produced but lying in the stockyard, waiting to be shipped. Uh, we conducted a post-mortem of the failed slab to understand and diagnose the cause. We did uh, two load tests on randomly selected panels for the second part and the, the, for the third we conducted a test program very judiciously planned. This is the fateful slab which had cracked, brought down. The first thing we noticed was that the topping of the concrete came off quite easily indicating a lack of bond between topping and hollow core slab which is an essential element for the composite action. Uh, the, we also noticed that the webs of this slab had uh, uh, uncompacted concrete full of voids and uh, honeycombs. Uh, for the post-mortem, we cut out three slices of the slab from the locations that you see. From each slice, we cut away these top portions in the form of prisms uh, to be tested for compression so we can know the concrete compressive strength. The lower part was set aside for testing the bond strength between the strand and the concrete. This is how the slice looked. There was lack of compaction. We saw voids out around the strands, honeycombing, indicating lack of compaction. More of the honeycombing and uh, often uncompact, uh, uncompacted uh, concrete with the uh, porosity. These are the four prisms that were taken, cut away from the top part for compression testing. And uh, four into three uh, prisms gave an average strength of about 26 MPa uh, as against the design strength of about 40 MPa. For the bond strength of the strands, we designed this contraption where uh, you could measure the force required to push the strand out of the concrete and the results were like this. Quite shockingly, in the first slice, all, all the three strands were finger push loose. In the second, the strengths were decent, about 0.6 and 1 MPa. And in the third, in fact, they were excessive because we found that the strands were rusted and so the interface was extremely rough. 
This is the load test being conducted on two of the randomly selected panels, complete panels. This is the arrangement of the uh, dial gauges. And uh, quite thankfully, we found a recovery of more than 90% in almost all the dial gauges. This is how we conducted the testing at the factory. Uh, we designed our own quick load test uh, to and, and we designed our own criteria for failing and passing. First there was a visual examination and then the quick test. Once we started testing, uh, just on the second day another failure happened in the test yard with only two-thirds of the design load applied. So from then on we decided to test every single slab. At the end of the testing, we ended up rejecting about 37 slabs from 300 lying in the factory. More observations of objectionable practices. Strand slippage is a major issue. You can see in the picture that the strand has slipped in by more than half an inch uh, because of poor bond between the strand and the concrete. In the supervisor's sheet below, you can see uh, several slabs being rejected of uh, slippages. So once this issue came, we decided to visit uh, another site and we saw where we saw uh, a pile which was ready for installation. And so on this table you see on top is the various slabs. On the left side you see five strands from the left side and then five, same five on the right side. Uh, in terms of the values, you see the yellow values are above 2, between 2 and 3 mm. The pink values are between 3 and 5 mm slippage. The brown ones are between 5 and 7 and above 7 is black. So actually all these red and blue, the red ones should definitely be rejected. The blue are borderline cases. But here is this uh, contractor who is ready to install all of these panels up there. There's no system of testing or uh, checking. Excess oil on bed due to worn out equipment. This is the bed on which they'll be casting the hollow core slab and they apply oil with a machine and if you leave excess oil you can imagine what is going to happen. The strands will get smeared with oil and uh, they can lead to slippages. There will be poor bond between the concrete and the strand. Same thing. Uh, on the same project we saw that the, the main structure was a steel frame which was erected three to four floors in advance and then the, uh, the hollow core slabs would be installed. So that made the installation process highly prone to accidental hits and that was seen in several slabs. On the second picture you see that the corner is uh, cracked. Uh, another one, the slab is almost uh, ready to be covered with the topping and the corner is actually broken off. Uh, damage in transit is yet another uh, issue and people do not take enough care in during transit. So here is rejection happening because damage happened in during transit. Stacking. Improper stacking can cause high cantilever load in the panel, in the, in the marked panel that you see bottom most, uh, leading to top tension in the unreinforced concrete. You see the top part of the concrete slab, hollow core slab, is unreinforced. So you cannot afford to have tension at all there. So if you have untrained personnel, these are the kind of things that can happen. Here is a stack uh, not very properly uh, stacked. Normally the, they do not stack more than four slabs and someone has uh, um, you know, put six uh, slabs in the stack. So if they see a pile of uh, slabs like this with such irregular core geometry, uh, you know, somebody should raise an alarm and if the team is uh, quality conscious, they would stop production. They would, uh, you know, make noise that there's something wrong, terribly wrong with either the machine, machine settings, or the concrete mix which is causing such depressions, etc. 
and production should stop. Latence. Latence is uh, this uh, paste-like material which comes out. It's actually a mixture of water and very fine paste of concrete which the cutting blade creates. So when you cut these slabs uh, transversely, you generate a lot of this paste which keeps on lying on the surface of the slab and uh, if you do not clean it while it is wet, it can dry off there and actually lead to debonding and there will be no bond with the topping. So that's a serious issue but nobody pays any attention to that. Uh, this is the kind of failure that can happen if your topping has not bonded properly with the hollow core slab. So this was the most common occurrence that uh, was observed. Most of the webs were honeycombed and like crushed and the single cause that was identified was a wrong setting in the machine the extruder machine that produces these slabs. There is a finishing plate at the end. After uh, the slab is extruded, the finishing plate finishes the top and the wrong setting of the finishing plate was crushing the slab and uh, you see what you saw. Plastic shrinkage cracking in overlays, very common. People do not understand why this is there, they just accept it. Uh, but no one makes an effort to understand why this is happening and take measures to not to allow it to happen. So recommendations, do not take hollow core slab for granted. There's a great need for a greater involvement of the structural engineers with the production process and site installation. Training, of course, at various levels is an imperative we must plan a minimum routine inspection or a test regime in the manufacturing facility which should include visual checks like core geometry, compaction, honeycombing, uh, strand slippages should be measured regularly, compressive tests, strand bond tests, overlay shear adhesion tests. We must have surprise process audits by experts who are well versed with the implications of each aspect. Violations must be recorded scrupulously and remedials put in place immediately. Thank you. Hello friends, I am Vivek Naik. Uh, if the organizers have missed it, I would just like to introduce myself. Uh, well, I am past president of Indian Concrete Institute and managing director of Apple Kimi. Uh, we are here at uh, India Construction Week 2020 and uh, this is a great thing which is brought to you by CIDC. And I would like to congratulate the organizers and especially Dr. Saroof for giving me this opportunity to be with you. Today, I'm going to talk uh, to you about precast works and jointing of panels. See, precast technology is very much there and it has got its advantages, disadvantages, and challenges, which we will discuss this in a short presentation. If you see the history, historically in 18th century, in 18th century, way back around uh, so many, so many years back, I think thousands and thousands of years back, in the Western world, in the Europe, there were some challenges. And to meet out those challenges, they found that construction over the bridge and over the bridge having one more aqueduct. So this is a very typical, very old uh, picture. Uh, but during managing this challenge, what the construction people thought that time that it will be better to cast large sections at one side in the Surti mortar, cure them, then transport them to the site and install. And I won't say fully that is a, this is a pre-cast structure, but this is the structure where large pieces were brought together and they were aggregated to make this structure wherein at one level you have an aqueduct and the other level you have a uh, road bridge. 
uh, that is the international scenario and historical stage. If you see the Indian scenario, uh, the precast in 1939 to 1943 uh, in Chennai, uh, Nepal Bridge was constructed, and it is constructed with precast and pre-stress technology. And even before that, even before that, uh, 1905 to 1910, uh, Madras port. Uh, they cast so many piles and uh, other elements, uh, even the long retaining wall, uh, and the wall is to the length of around six kilometers in precast segments and put it there at the place. So you can say that precast has come to the life to meet out the site challenges. We construction engineers thought that why not to cast a piece and then take to the site and just install it. So that in situ work can be avoided. And then it went on developing, and then there are further uh, developments which we will discuss further. So, uh, if you see overall uh, precast uh, concrete system as such, uh, what you do is first the concrete, which is the basic ingredient, obviously, but in precast concrete, the concrete is designed to have a good demolding properties most of the time it is demolding time which is important because the mold is reused and reused and the repetition of the mold carries the essence of precasting technology so quicker demolding is one parameter so you need higher early strength so also you need lesser of a curing time or uh, there are some uh, dry mixes which are used and then you demold the product and then you put it for the curing, whether it is a steam curing or water curing or uh, any other form of it. And the third aspect when you design concrete is what finish you want after the concrete comes out of the mold, after the concrete is on the side. That is the aesthetics and the finish. So you can be having various molds and uh, on the molds, you can have some so many designs in laser, whatever texturing, so that the final product is having that look. Uh, coming to the molds uh, where the precasting, uh, precast concrete is put in, is uh, uh, you can have molds in steel, we can have molds in aluminium, you can have it in FRP, PVC, and many other materials also. As far as the handling is concerned, uh, you design concrete for initial handling, that is uh, removing the concrete from the molds and putting it in the yard. That is first stage. And the second stage is you handle it with crane, put it in the flatbed trailers or transport then transport it to the site, stack it there and all those handling parameters. So that is how you do the handling. Uh, system in the precast uh, works. Uh, the most crucial uh, in uh, this discussion where I am going to give a little more emphasis is the jointing of uh, precast segments uh, wherein we talk of jointing technology and jointing materials and obviously the finishing systems. So hereafter what we give more emphasis is the overall system but the focus will be on the jointing materials and jointing technologies. Well, uh, as uh, we have seen that uh, why precast? Yes, uh, this is a comparative study and uh, it is sourced from uh, some international manuals. And this is just uh, brought in for you people for the understanding that uh, when you do cast in place work, <clears throat> comparatively, you uh, save uh, time and money and then uh, you have steel and uh, precast composite work. Uh, then you save a little more of it. And you want to save more is steel and directly brick work or block work. You save further time. And precast is the technology which will give you work at a very high speed and maximum of the cost saving. This has been proved. And that is why today we are talking about the precasting. Most of the time in India and in uh, the part of the world, low-cost housing is a very common phenomenon because it is a repetitive job. Uh, you do uh, housing um, on a very, very large scale, 
on uh, in large tournaments and uh, you can get the benefit of uh, precasting technology uh, but not only limited to uh, the um, housing uh, there are varieties of precast structures that underground structures can be in precast foundations can be in precast tunnel tunnel segments can be in precast the various wall panels and retaining walls can be in precast housing yes we have already uh, talked about it infra buildings larger scale infra buildings can be in precast and not last but the least even the reservoirs or tanks can be very well done in precast just you have to take care of the joints uh, uh, i will just run through some of the uh, pictures of uh, this is about a precast uh, work uh, underground and this uh, the right hand side is a precast barrier these are the barriers which uh, normally you are using uh, for the uh, by the sole, uh, side of uh, highways and roads uh, so also uh, precast manholes and tanks uh, are quite liberally used and they give you uh, quite a lot of speed and higher quality uh, precast roads uh, you say how many yeah i am not sure but in uh, mostly in every country these days you will find that they have done some precast roads here or there at least somewhere 4 5 km 10 km trial roads are done and uh, they have been found very successful the most important part again is very good quality and in very short time there is a challenge friends when you are doing precast roads that the sub base has to be very very good and the base preparation what i mean uh, a fully leveled base is very very important that is why what you can see in the center of the screen there are shims on the road which is a leveling mark to what extent the fill can be done and to your right you can see the shims are fully embedded and the stone dust or any other subgrade is put flush with that now as you have got a level base you can put your panel on there if there is a little bit of a deviation in this then you will be finding cracks and then there are a lot of challenges uh, in the road segment uh, uh, next is uh, then when you are done with the road there can be convert uh, many culverts or uh, underpasses below the uh, roads or uh, larger pipe segments where uh, uh, precast things can be used uh, precast boundary walls and retaining walls have been used uh, from quite initial stages and today also we are using it but now people are going in for new designs uh, and new textures in the precasting things uh, uh, looking at the methods of precasting and the systems uh, one uh, uh, thing is you have large panel system wherein you are doing large infrastructure elements like factories and buildings you have a big segment you cast it and put it into the uh, place so that is one in this system there is a large modules large modules uh, are there and these large modules are cast in one go you have got the entire uh, block of maybe an apartment or at least one or two rooms or even the service blocks because what gives you a benefit is if you look at the overall construction you know friends that uh, when you are doing building construction maximum time is spent uh, in uh, service area because in the toilets and washrooms you have got electricity water service lines plumbing hot water cold water so many things but if you have got all the things already embedded in the service block and the service block is made ready with the sanitary fittings and brought directly to the site it saves a lot of time and it carries a lot of sense in doing the work that way so that is one plus point of precasting uh, about the columns and beams casting yes you can do the column casting at one place and just install the column these are the columns of heavy industries and then you can ground them again the connection connection of uh, precast column with the foundation is quite crucial and the grouting will come down to that particular part of it in future um, uh, precasting wherever these connections are avoided especially in the smaller uh, buildings mostly what is useful is footing plus column 
so you have a stub column and a footing everything put together it should be it can be cast together and then you shift it to the side and that gives a benefit uh, staircase is a quite critical element of precasting and you can do it in the uh, one uh, two or three elements and directly install it at the side if you are talking about the joints yes there are a lot of codal provisions uh, isbs and astm codes which tell you how to design the joint and which materials are to be uh, used that you can definitely peep into the codal provisions i am not uh, discussing that here but what i am discussing here is the challenge and how to meet the practical challenge uh, see the, the joints can be categorized basically into the vertical and the horizontal segments and then you have a mechanical uh, connect between the two joints and then you have sealants and adhesives and the protection coatings and the protection strip seals are coming on the surface where, which is we can call it as a weather strip or and then the sealants are uh, polyurethane sealant or silicon sealant and many many other things <clears throat> this is one out of it that you have uh, if you are talking about jointing material it is a sealant packing and grout this is how i categorize packing is something a filler and a flexible media sealants are there to stay on the exterior side of the joint uh, and uh, yeah, there are grouts which are used at the installation stage and this is what uh, we have is a segment uh, of a precast segment of a road maybe these are large segments of around uh, at the top it is around 24 meters in width and these segments can be cast and just put it at one place and you can make it a flyover or a bridge and what is crucial is segment bonding adhesive when you put two segments together uh, you need to cover the entire surface area which is coming in contact so uh, normally this is 2 to 3 mm uh, even less than 3 mm and then you squeeze the two segments and the jointing material comes out of it uh, that is obviously at the time of post tensioning uh, there is one very very typical thing i have seen is coupler uh, grouts coupler grouts uh, are the uh, grouts which are not very uh, carefully looked into by the construction industry and that is why i think i wanted to stress this here that uh, let's go a little further the uh, waiting uh, see uh, if you are talking about the precast construction what i said is uh, accurate casting safe transport careful installation at the site and precast jointing and the joint is the key factor <clears throat> why i'm saying uh, joint is the key factor very recently in 2011 in 2011 uh, in san antonio texas uh, where when there was an earthquake almost all the structures which collapsed and the collapses pertaining to the precast were and the failure of the connections and failure at the joints may it is in the column or at the base plate or even pv structure everywhere they were in the joints only and this very well tells us that we need to focus and be more careful at the joint when you are talking about the precast technology this is a typical scene when we noted that improper grouting was done at the joints and the joint plates uh, going further uh, what uh, you see is the precast joint at the foundation level wherein uh, you have a, a double pins coming up and you put your column on the top of it or you have a coupler which is uh, added here that is quite clear from the screen similarly you uh, have a foundation where you can have a column which is either smooth then you put a column put it into the groove of the pocket foundation or you have a rough pocket foundation and you again put it into both the systems are used or uh, the lower part of your screen you can see it is at the site installation where a larger piece of uh, concrete uh, is cast uh, to install the precast column uh, this is what the uh, coupler i mean these are the couplers and the extending pieces uh, these are used for the extension of uh, and the continuity of the reinforcement 
and there are various uses of it you can use it in the infrastructure like what i have shown over here this is a huge column and the beam connection or vertical connection also uh, these couplers uh, can be tested in the laboratory uh, and uh, the grounds which are used in the coupler are even more important because the coupler basically is a mechanical thing and it can be tested for various mechanical parameters and uh, what i have shown you here on the screen is uh, this coupler and uh, you uh, put the other piece of this uh, reinforcement into the coupler before that you are grouting it uh, the coupler is fully grouted and then you put the next portion over here so this is what i have shown it you on the left hand side of your screen uh, allow this to set then you test it if you splice it horizontally what you should see what you can should see ideally is the right hand side portion this is what i mean the grout along along the rebar should be absolutely full and total so that shows a full grip if you cut the splice right so this is to be done mechanically by force and the other part of the testing the grout is you can put it into the testing machine tensile failures which you see and if you go in for the tensile failure the failure should be in the parent material obviously it should be in the rebar and not in the coupler section well so this coupler section should remain intact and the failure should come here or here whatever it may be and there are various technical parameters in the graphs and all this i am not going into the depth of it but uh, that is what it is uh, in the laboratory we definitely check up uh, this is only a test piece those don't go by this why there are so many openings uh, this is how the test piece of the coupler is put and you check up what is the requisite length of the coupler required for a particular diameter rod and for particular stretch is a design part of the coupler and then you uh, use it but my main interest and the uh, concern point is how you use the installation grout uh, see there will be manufacturers this is one of the best manufacturers uh, as yes they have said that it will be pre mix non shrink free free flow high strength uh, panel grout or joint grout and there will be a test certificate or a manufacturer test certificate what is our duty as a consultant or a construction engineer that you get it tested through nabl accredited laboratory verify the test parameters verify the compressive strength whether you are getting it and whether you are getting the desired strength that yes if what is claimed on the third day the same should be there what is claimed on the seventh day same you should be getting after the validation and the proper testing only we should be going ahead and more uh, serious is the coupler joint crowd because most of the places in the coupler joint crowd because it is a splice of the reinforcement and in that cases what you see uh, or uh, what is what is technically required is the crowd should have strength of 100 newton per mm square minimum so you we need to have and we need to ensure that on the third day the grout attains a strength of little more than 16 newton on the seventh day and on the 20th day you very well get 100 newton and those verification should be done and then these things should be used and this is these are the photographs i would like to sh just show you this is the continuity i have shown on the left hand side of thing this is the column over the column these are the column connections with the couplers then these are the beam connections this is how you do this is uh, a t beam sort of thing or rather a bracket and you put the two sections on that and then you have the coupler here and these couplers can be tested for various seismic loads and the lateral behaviors because that is the place where they fail uh, so also at the foundation level also you have the couplers get it tested and then this is what you do or rather what the manufacturer should do in the laboratory to ensure that the grouts and the coupler stand to the expectation and uh, they are designed for that earthquake uh, parameters in future let's see these are the precast buildings to come these are the precast building they are already designed they are already designed they are on the way to come and these are the precast things so they are we construction engineers have got a great challenge to meet with these technologies in 
and improve the construction technology to um, stand to the expectation of this uh, fancy designing things. And these changes will take our technology further. So these are the things which are coming up. Uh, so also I told you about the precast roads and well, what is required again in the precast road that it should be a smart road. So we should be in a position to put the sensors in the precast things after you put the sensors the, or the processors and they can pass on the information about the pavement, what is happening to the concrete in a precast pavement, what is happening below the uh, pavement that is to the bed uh, what is happening with the movement of the traffic and with those uh, data we can again further uh, modify or improve the technologies in the future uh, precast materials what is uh, likely to come up is smog eating concrete uh, because uh, I know for sure that in every country and every place uh, the problem of smog and the heavy pollution is there and uh, these are uh, special uh, materials we, uh, in precast which are coming where the concrete is treated with titanium dioxide and it is exposed to ultraviolet rays and then uh, it is accelerated with natural oxidation process and they eat the polluting uh, elements they eat the polluting elements and they also maintain the surface very clean after the rain and water and uh, these uh, technologies definitely have got uh, some challenges but uh, they can be best used for the transportation barriers and the buildings these are uh, I, to my knowledge in the uh, laboratory only or in the research center but soon they will hit uh, the site and i look forward to that so, in concluding uh, remarks, I would like to say that precast is not fully explored uh, and especially in India, there are a lot of benefits and we should go in for that. Jointing and connection design developments, there are a lot of opportunities, there are new developments yet to come up. Jointing materials and development are the key and the most crucial thing which I will again report, uh, repeat before I close is the materials for jointing need more and more development and need more and more testing. With that, I put my short presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Now, hereafter, if you have got any questions and answers, uh, questions, I will be ready for the answers. And I wish you a good day and a safe life. Thank you very much. Thank you, the organizers, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Hi. Greetings for the day. At the outset, I am thankful to CIDC for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. I am Anand Goswami, a project management consultant, managing precast building projects with a team of about 50 odd engineers. We are placed in Pune. Now, the topic of discussions today is aspects of site administration and control in precast building projects. Now, aspects of project management aspects of various projects to be, attributes of various projects to be managed, monitored. They are more or less same in almost all the types of projects. The principles are same, but the way or the manner in which these aspects actually impact on the performance or these are importance of these aspects in managing the things, they change. The manner changes, the impact Changes. See, attributes of the asset is what you already know. That maybe when I manage project, what do I have to manage? I have to manage man, I have to manage material, I have to manage machinery, I have to manage buildings, cash flows, documentation, documentation controls, references of documentation, and what not. I manage quality, I manage time, I manage cost, I manage buildings, I manage cash flows. Now, is the manner of managing these projects remain same throughout all the types of projects or do they change? If I am working in a conventional project, the attributes, their impacts will be something different. If I am using my own technology, again, these things will change. Even the sequencing of activities may change. Some items may go out, some items may come in. There may be some certain simultaneous activities involved. There may be some certain simultaneous activities that are in my one 
may be sequential in case of conversion or even in precast these things will change materially so when i am managing the project i have to just see to it that i am managing my project considering the impacts of these impacts of various project things like maybe location maybe the size maybe the technology more particularly technological impacts are to be seen when i am managing so uh, i am just going to deliver it on aspects of site administration in precast engineering projects now of all these things that are in front of you human resource on site facilities layouts material procurement management of wastages construction equipments budgets cash flows what will materially change when i am managing the precast projects in my opinion human resources requirements of human resource management site operational setups actually speaking on site facilities and layouts material procurement and construction equipments and uh, machineries these aspects do materially change when we speak of precast building projects now in case of a precast building projects the actual execution is done at two places one i am constructing a building at the building place conventionally maybe in foundations and then erecting precast in equip uh, precast components and b simultaneously i am precasting the various components required for the erection of buildings so today i am going to speak on two major aspects which in my opinion are very important and i speak of building precast building projects one is man management how the man management is needed to be handled or how the man management is needed to be looked up on in precast industry second materials or precast components manufacturing and management actual equipment management is another important aspect but looking to the constraints of time we will be talking on these two aspects one is man management one is materials now when i say i am going to execute a precast work what i need i need the team which is technically qualified and well versed with the cast building technologies see i also need skilled labor force totally oriented and trained in build up building the cast projects conventional skilled labor for conventional projects skilled manpower for technical men for for conventional projects are easily available other building technologies that are used may not be requiring that high skill sets which are totally different than the skill sets required for the conventional projects and hence that manpower can be available however when it comes specifically to precast building work i need this manpower with a different skill set now i am not going to get them readily available in the market if i am augmenting if i am growing i need to train the people i need to train the skill labor force now when i am training these particular labor force or when i am training technical manpower i cannot open schools to train them i don't have time to i pay them and i train them which is not acceptable so how do i make my teams how do i govern my teams and how do i how do i train my core manpower a particular way has to be properly see i always have a set or i always have a small group of people who are already trained how do we learn things how do we get to know the technologies and how do we adapt and implement these technologies now when we are formally trained in college we are trained technically as we claim to of course i hardly understand what is taught in college or how what will we learn there when we really pass out from the college i personally feel i have been learning throughout in the field itself 
However, how do I learn or how do I get take, make myself proficient in a particular technology or particular manner of work? I may be formally, formally trained or I may be sent to training abroad and get these things done. But most of the training, most of the learning, how do they come? I define a know how. A learned or acquired knowledge of technical skill regarding how to do things well. See, this is important. What do I need to know? I need to know how to do things well. Know how may be result of what? It may be result of experience, transfer of knowledge, formal transfer of knowledge, you can say, or hands on practice. Now, more particularly, when we speak of these technologies, what is important in my opinion? Hands on practice. People acquire technical know how by receiving formal or informal education, training, or this is important working closely with an expert in a certain field. Now, how can I get myself trained in precast technology? Maybe I have a team of around 25 people who are technically trained and are working with me for a good time. And a new project comes and I need 100 of such 10 people. What I have to do? I have to make a small team wherein my own original five people will be there. And I add up some certain number of untrained ones and I want mixed bag of trained and untrained people wherein all the 25 people in some days will be trained. How are they trained? Working closely with an expert in a certain field. See, this is very important when it comes to pickups. I am not going into technical aspects of training needs and all those things. But if I train or I work with an expert, I automatically develop those skill sets of expertizing it. Now, this is required in both the cases. This is required for the technical manpower as well as skilled workforce. Now, once this skilled workforce or technical manpower is available with me, can I afford attrition? Now, let's say in India, there are a few companies who are into building uh, precast projects. Now, when I train some certain people with me, there is a chance of they going out the moment they go out, my curve of performance will come down because then again I will be taking a new team, training them, then I will reach to a peak of my performance curve. And maybe if I continue with this particular team, then only I will be able to deliver a quality product. But if my team goes out, like this has happened in COVID, that many have gone home and didn't come back in daily projects. I have to develop, we have to develop new gangs. What has happened? Temporary, the curve of performance has come down. So in this particular field, retention of manpower which is trained is very important. Nothing else, rest of the things are common, but training, making them expert in a particular area of work and maintaining them is important when it comes to the manpower management. So maybe you have to provide them proper facilities, you may have to look at the welfare of the people working with you and there has to be adequacy of continuous work availability. The work availability has to be adequate so that they can sustain and survive with you. So next up, actual another aspect is managing precast components. Now managing precast components, why this is important? Now when you are constructing a precast building project, you are precasting them first. So what I can say, my building is manufactured at ground first. I, mean, I have to have sufficient manufacturing facilities which will produce these precast components for. Now, these precast components, can I manufacture them and keep in, uh, for three years and I'll be using it? No. If I do it, there may be some certain quality aspects, there may be stacking issues or there may be some other thing. So, what is what has to be looked upon? The material needs to be perfectly managed. I have to plan my production in such a manner that I fulfill the requirement of site. So when I say, let's say I am I am I am manufacturing 
beams, I'm manufacturing columns, I'm manufacturing slabs. I have got, let us say, five different types of building modules. So five different types of building modules, each of module may have, let us say, 25 to 30 different types of beams. Now these 25 to 30 type of different types of beams into, let us say, five or 10 modules. So each, each component may have at least 100 different types. Now when I am manufacturing these 100 different types and stacking them in my stacking yards, identifying where they are stacked or the manner of stacking also becomes very important. Because if I am not stacking them properly, if I am not able to look at them properly, I will not be able to get the component that is required when I need it for the index. Now many a times it may be so, it may be so happening that I may not have a sufficient space for the casting yard at size. So I may cast these components somewhere else and I may use them somewhere else. So I may need space for stacking at two places. One stacking place near my manufacturing unit and another stacking place near my site execution. Now at both the places, stacking has to be in such a manner that these particular components can be located, easily removed and used for the erection of blocks. So I have to match up with the speed of erection that is there on the site. I have to match up with the requirements of components, specific types or specific modules and deliver them. If this is not happened, what will happen? I will not be able to give the progress. Let's say I have about 5,000 components in my yard, but none of these components match to my requirements. I have about 15 or 50 buildings constructing, and let's say as I go up, my design requirements are reduced. So my size of component may change, my grade of concrete for the component change, and my steel requirement may change. And I am going in phases. Now if I am going in phases, what will happen? I may complete 10 buildings first, then next 10 buildings, next 10, then 10 buildings, maybe depending on the equipment availability. Now if this so happens and my person on the precasting had completes production of all the first five floors, I will not be able to get the components in time because by the time my sixth or seventh floor of the first building starts, if the components are not ready in the second year, precasting year, I will not be able to erect them though my first five floors are complete. So proper synergy, proper interface and proper coordination is required for the managing precursors. This area appear very simple or easy, but if I show you some photographs, how huge these things are, can be seen. See, these are the sub, some pictures of stacking gas, where in columns are stacked, slabs are stacked, beams are stacked. And now if I need beam, which is right at the um, lowermost layer, I have to disturb all the things. How do I manage? I may have to manage the stacking gateways. Even in case of columns, I will have to manage in such a manner that specific type of component can be located properly and can be easily removed and transported to site. Maybe on site, these yards may not have such huge numbers. Maybe on, because I may be stacking specific number of components required in a particular building within the radius of the yard. So maybe if I need, let's say 500 components or 300 components per floor, depending upon the size of building, I may have a small area or space required at that particular location. I'm, of course, I will have to have proper inventory in my yards so that even if there are some breakdowns in manufacturing units, the work at site shall not be handled. So this is how the manufacturing of precast components and stacking needs to be managed. A short time I had 15 minutes, 12 minutes within which I can discuss whatever I can deliver. I have tried to do it so. And then I will conclude from the discussions, it is clear that even though the aspects of site administration and control remain the same in all the projects, perspective, impact, and importance of these aspects change from project to project and depend on many factors such as technology use, type of projects, duration, location, etc. Project manager, 
planning engineers should understand these impacting factors and consider these things and their impacts while planning. Thank you. Any queries are welcome. This is my personal detail and my mail IDs. Your queries, any queries regarding the uh, precast works are most welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much.